So it, it's now 58 years ago that Sputnik opened the space age. And uh, currently we are in a very exciting phase because on one side we have interplanetary mission expanding our, uh, our knowledge about the universe a lot, like Rosetta, like Huygens, and we have uh, the area of small satellites opening the world for a paradigm change to have commercial small satellites established by uh, small teams. And uh, so it's changing uh, the whole area of, sp of space exploration. I want to address these different topics today. My background was in space industry, so I had the opportunity and privilege to work on big interplanetary mission in the realization in space industry. So I worked on Huygens, which went down to the Saturnian largest moon, Titan, which is a very interesting spot because there you have organic molecules. So the story starts uh, with the Voyager spacecraft who flew by in 3,000 kilometer distance and should explore the atmosphere, but they couldn't penetrate because the atmosphere was, was more thick than ever expected. So the instrumentation on board could not penetrate, but they could detect the upper layers and it included hydrocarbons. These are the ingredients of organic chemistry, so these are the precursors of life. And uh, it quickly became top priority on the list of scientists to go there, to explore this exciting atmosphere of a moon, and a moon very far away from the sun. So what was expected there was some pristine soup of life in this very remote place, and uh, it originated in this joint ESA-NASA mission, Cassini-Huygens. The Cassini spacecraft is still in orbit around Saturn and provides exciting images about this remote world. And uh, Huygens was actually the first entry mission we had in Europe designed. Russia, United States did entry missions here on Earth. Yeah, it's easier. We know our Earth's atmosphere pretty well from ground observations. In Titan, we had no idea. Only the upper layers were explored. And nevertheless, the spacecraft had to descend to the surface. And uh, it was essential to have adaptive control algorithms to control autonomously the descent to the surface. This was complicated because the spacecraft acts as a relay and was flying by while the descent of the small spacecraft Huygens was to the surface. And the flyby spacecraft acts as a relay link for the data for the transmission to Earth. All this had to be handled autonomously because the distance is so large that the radio communication takes about one hour to reach the Earth. So remote control is impossible. So the interesting feature was that uh, data collected from the sensors had to be collected to update the atmospheric model, to update the entry predictions, the landing based on a parachute. Yeah, and uh, the way was to uh, change from a large parachute to a smaller one to accelerate, but all this had to be handled autonomously. And uh, the basic background for autonomous reaction was to learn during the descent more and more details about the atmosphere, about the atmospheric layers, 
and to adapt the descent control of the spacecraft in such a way that the surface impact could be monitored and the data could be transmitted down to Earth. So one interesting application of autonomous reaction capabilities and this happened in 2005, 14th of January, and it worked very well. So it landed, like predicted, with a small deviation of five minutes and was a very nice example of learning in space while you do, are performing a mission to detect this um, material analysis of the atmospheric components of the organic chemistry going on on Titan. And this provides very interesting links to origin of life here on Earth. Because what we have now uh, is uh, very advanced. What we have on Titan is maybe four million years ago on Earth. So it looks back into history. Another very interesting and challenging mission is Rosetta. You might have seen in 2014, in November, a small spacecraft landed on a comet. And Rosetta is the big spacecraft which accompanies the, plan, the comet even today. So uh, comets are one hypothesis to explain the huge amount of water we have on Earth. And comets also include organic chemistry materials. So one hypothesis from science was that comets are responsible for the water on Earth and also um, of uh, precursor building blocks for life. But uh, this was the background to send a, a spacecraft to a comet and it was composed of two components, Rosetta, the main spacecraft, doing the remote observation of the comet, doing long-term observation, and a small spacecraft called Phile to land or actually on the comet. This was a mission which I was uh, accompanying for about 25 years now. So it's a very long duration to implement the spacecraft this took about 12 years to uh, transfer from Earth towards the comet. Took another 12 years. And uh, so all together with interruptions and political uh, issues, technical issues, it took about 25 years. Now, it happened very well and it's very exciting results. Also here autonomy plays a key role. Autonomous reaction was necessary because the signal propagation delay from the comet to Earth is in the order of about uh, half an hour. It's about 500 million kilometer distance and r radio signals despite the huge velocity of light require about half an hour. So Rosetta has to chase the comet, has to approach rendezvous, and uh, this happened uh, in uh, the spring of 2014. It was quite challenging topic. And then in November 2014, the landing occurred. So there was time to observe the comet, to understand the dynamics, to do a smart approach. And Rosetta delivered the Phile lander completely passive. So from a distance of 12 kilometers, deployed the lander, and the lander within seven hours went to the surface. A comet is like a big mountain. So it's a mass of uh, causing a gravity 
one divided by hundred thousand the mass of the Earth gives you the comet. And it's completely dark. So if it's far out, you need a lot of computer processing of uh, contrast enhancement to really see images. It was the autonomous descent was a very challenging issue and uh, it was the gravity was very low. So a lot of disturbance influences act. Also here the autonomous reaction was inherent and as it happened finally it was even more exciting because the Phile lander was targeted to a very smooth terrain and uh, nevertheless it decided to do differently. It was a, it, all the, uh, all the technical means to fix it on the surface failed. So the lander went down and bounced back. So it did a jump of a one kilometer altitude and bumped twice before it settled in a cliff. So from the soft surface area where a lot of dust was, it bounced and ended in a very interesting spot. Nobody would have dared to land there, but it worked and it worked very well. So we get now a lot of interesting materials from a riff on the comet. So also here autonomy played a key role. And what we are trying now in current research aspects is how to autonomously coordinate several spacecraft in orbit. So traditional spacecraft are multifunctional. Traditional spacecraft uh, perform in parallel many instrument measurements. What we want to realize are distributed spacecraft within the same budget frame. So instead of one one-ton spacecraft, you can place many small spacecraft at one kilogram of mass. And uh, that's the basic idea to, to use miniaturization technology we have today, to have advanced data processing on board. Our microprocessors are very capable today. So the software on board coordinates multiple spacecraft, which are weak, but in coordination, they really do a strong performance. So it's a paradigm shift in the design of spacecraft. It will not change everything. We will have big spacecraft for challenging tasks, but it can, they can be complemented by distributed sp small spacecraft, and this will increase performance dramatically. So also here in Skoltech, there are teams working on this around Alessandro Golka, and uh, we are cooperating in this in order to realize such distributed spacecraft systems. Also here, autonomy pl plays a key role. The satellites in an Earth orbit, orbit typically takes about 100 minutes. And, uh, only about 90% of the time they are on their own. Only 10 minutes they have contact to a ground station in average. So 90% they have to interact autonomously. They have to cooperate, keep distances at appropriate level, avoid collisions, things like that. Yeah? This needs to be done autonomously because you only have to a very short duration of time contact to the ground station. Of course, you take advantage of this contact as much as possible, but you need autonomous reaction capabilities for the rest of the time when you fly in a formation. And uh, 
this offers a lot of application opportunities in telecommunication, in earth observation. If you have joint observation of the same surface spot from different directions, you can reconstruct three-dimensional images. Yeah, and so uh, this offers a lot of application opportunities, but it requires coordinated efforts in space. The spacecraft have to talk to each other, so you have a communication link. You have controls in a distributed way via the communication link to have a meaningful coordination. And uh, this is currently a very exciting scientific area how to do control via communication links because controls are packet oriented, are digitized, while control usually have a continuous flow of information, have at least fixed sampling intervals. And this needs coordination and it's really challenging scientific research in control technology, in communication technology. And the realization is happening in satellite formations, in fragmented spacecrafts. And uh, that's a new approach to achieve very interesting new results. It includes also a lot of technology challenges we have to face in academia. But the benefit would be improved observation capabilities distributed observations and this opens the door to a lot of exciting new results, research results.